Well, we're very pleased uh, to welcome this week um, Tony Robin, who is going to talk about the De, I'm not sure I can pronounce this, De Bruning algebra for quasi crystals. And I think there's a bit more, but I've forgotten it. <laughs> Over to you, Tony. Thank you. Uh, Are you uh, a joint uh, host. Okay, so I can see myself. Okay, maybe it's better if I don't. Everybody can see me. Uh, yep. Uh, Scott Carter's in the admit Scott. <clears throat> I'm sure everybody knows these. Um, Penrose tiles. Mine come with notches and you put them together notch to notch. Those are the local uh, matching rules. <coughs> Excuse me. And that tells you how to make a quasi crystal. Many years ago, I heard a lecture by Penrose and uh, he had a drawing of about 15 or 20 of these tiles put together with the local matching rules. Uh, but he said it was a bad crystal seed uh, in that uh, after just one more tile on the left or one more tile on the right, uh, you, you couldn't um, make another legal move. And so he concluded that there were no uh, foolproof local matching rules and that uh, any real life quasi crystal must be self-assembling according to some global method, something like uh, quantum information at a distance. Well, there are uh, real quasi-crystals. Famously, Schechtman got the Nobel Prize for finding them in the lab. And very impressively, Steinhardt found them in outer space in, in the form of meteorites that fell to Earth uh, in the Gobi Desert. So how did they self-assemble? In 1981, uh, Nicholas de Brun made an algorithm that allowed one to uh, make arbitrarily large, perfect mathematical quasi-crystals. So my proposal is that we look into the uh, uh, de Brun algorithm, look deep into it, and see if that couldn't be a model for uh, quantum non-locality. Now a model doesn't solve all problems, but maybe it could get one to think differently about a problem, or uh, maybe it could just allow one to get used to this very, very counterintuitive idea of quantum non-locality. So in that spirit, let's uh, begin. Part one is the simplest formulation of the quasi uh, of the De Bruyne algorithm for quasi crystals. And that's about 25 minutes. And then we'll look at a much more sophisticated version of the same algorithm. So I'm going to switch my cameras now and I'm gonna put you on my desktop. And there you have it. So this is uh, De Bruyne. When I met him, he was in his 80s and I was in my 40s. We were at a conference and uh, he, I had this big suitcase and he, he sort of took it out of my hands and said, come on, let's go, uh, don't wanna be late. Uh, I want you to have a picture of him as a very vigorous man. Uh, he, was 72 <laughs> years, he was 72 years old when he, um, when he invented this algorithm, already retired, I believe, from Eindhoven University. And here it is. I've drawn a box with a two, but I mean you to see that this is a two-dimensional grid over the whole space. I've sliced it with a line. The slope of the line is one to one plus the square root of five over two. Uh, the golden ratio, about 1.61802. And <clears throat> what I'm going to do is erect 
on this line a, a barrier or a test. I, I'm gonna call it a target. I, I like the target. And from the points in the two-dimensional grid, I'm going to shoot, uh, uh, shoot towards the uh, target, shoot vectors towards the target. If I miss, forget about it. But if it hits, it sticks. And as time goes on, you get more and more. Uh, we're going to need a higher and higher resolution on, on, the, on the target, but that can be done. And then when we get a goodly number, we're going to shoot them back into the bulk, back into the n-dimensional space, back into the two-dimensional space. And then, and only then, will we project them down to the line. And you'll find that when we do this, there'll be only two kinds of line segments, a long one and a, and a short one. And those lengths will be in the golden ratio. And the whole thing will be a Fibonacci series or uh, a one dimensional quasi. <clears throat> now, this method can be easily uh, expanded to uh, make quasi-crystals of two dimensions or three dimensions or even four dimensions. But before we go there, uh, I would like to characterize some of these different elements. This element up here, the two-dimensional the two grid, if you were standing at the origin right there, and I were to ask you what's going on up here, you could answer immediately and with confidence that there's going to be a square. I instinctively draw these in perspective, but it's supposed to be the same size. So you'll know that it's a square, that it'll be this big, that'll be oriented this way, that it won't be cocked like this or like that. Uh, it's E2. And you'll also uh, be able to tell me and know for a fact yourself that uh, there'll be a square on top, a square to the right, one below, and one to the left. Conversely, if you're down here in the n over two space, the one dimensional space, the space of our experience, and I ask you, what's going on up here? Uh, your honest answer could only be, I don't know. I'll have to hike up there and get back to you. If you were the proverbial lazy mathematician and I gave you some more information, I say uh, it's a Fibonacci series and you're starting with a, a long piece, then you could substitute a long and a short for a long or a long for a short and you could virtually get out to this point and, and, and tell me whether it's a long or it's a short, whether on the southern end is a short or a long and same for the uh, upper end. But you would not have what you had in this case, which is an immediate certain uh, uh, knowledge of this object at a distance. Now I'd like to characterize this. This is neither fish nor fowl. It's not this and it's not this. And the meaning of it's neither fish nor fowl is beware of false dichotomies. You, you could be something else. Uh, you could have uh, vegan, uh, vegan on your menu uh, instead of just fish and fowl. But there's, there's a connotation that 
well, if it's neither fish nor fowl, uh, how good could it be really? So I'm making a big deal out of this, but this is critically important later. It's something we brought into being to accomplish a small part of the task, a small task within the larger uh, algorithm. And we can dispose of it as soon as it's done its work. And the most egregious thing, the most cavalier thing I said was, well, we're going to just reverse, uh, just reverse the uh, projection. We're going to undo it. We're going to send it back up into the bulk. And if we're modeling physical systems, that's, that just can't be. Uh, I'm going to show you that in two different ways. Now, I, I can't really see my, uh, oh, okay. Here is a cube and here is the projection of a cube. Roger, you have to tell me if, if this is, not, I can't, I don't have my screen full size. Um, so the question is, is this the top and this one the bottom? Or is it vice versa? I don't know. I can't tell. That information has been lost in the projection. I don't know if the projection went like this or went like this. I do notice that there's some uh, overlap here. There's some interlacing. And uh, whenever you see interlacing like that, you know, probably there's some projection at work. Uh, so I wanna show you the same thing in a different way. This is a single line of code. Now, I understand that you cannot read this, uh, but for, um, for uh, dramatic purposes, I wanted it all in one line, and it could be written all, all in one line. It's in a computer language called Formian uh, that comes from the civil engineering department at the university in, in Guilford. And it's a very powerful uh, pattern generation uh, language and it's been a godsend for me. And what this does in this one line of code, it makes over 46,000 cubes set into six dimensional space. In other words, each one of these cubes has um, vertices with uh, six coordinates and they all pack together to make a uh, six dimensional cubic lattice. Now, if you were to take that cubic lattice and project it to three space in such a way uh, that it would make a quasi crystal, you need a bigger code. Here's the code that I wrote uh, about 1985. I wrote it in Pascal. It's, uh, it's pretty dense. And it's 650 lines long. So if you have something, an object, a system that you can completely uh, define in one line of code, and then you do something to it uh, so that it needs 650 lines of code to describe it, that's entropy. Uh, that's a tent peg in, in the sands of time. That's a, a one-way ticket bought on sale, no exchange, no returns, no, ex no money back. Uh, that's a grandma's teacup, the one with the gold rim that you took out of the cabinet and projected it to the floor. 
you really have no expectation that it's going to reassemble and jump back into your hand. So with those characterizations, let's climb the dimension ladder. To make a two-dimensional quasi-crystal, and we see this. We need uh, to start with a four-dimensional cubic lattice. We're gonna, our, our target is going to be a pentagon. We shoot to the target. If it hits, it sticks. If it doesn't, forget about it. And then, and only then, we return uh, the vectors to their uh, four-dimensional origins. And uh, then we project down to a plane. And if we do it right, we will make a two-dimensional quasi-crystal, a Penrose tiling. Now the unit cells are these ROMs that I showed you. And uh, I can put two of them, I can overlay two. The, uh, the edge lengths are the same. Hey, that's why it tessellates. And I could cut this corner off and put it over here. And I could cut this corner off on the green one and put it over there. And then I would have two rectangles with different altitudes. You can measure them and find that the altitudes are in the golden ratio. And so the area of the unit cells are in the golden ratio. The unit cells previously were line segments, their lengths were in the, in, in the golden ratio. The unit cells here are ROMs and their areas are in the golden ratio. Moving to the next dimension. We're going to need a six dimensional cubic lattice. We're uh, going to be projecting not to a plane, but to a hyperplane. And we need a target. This is the target. Yep. I think I have to do this, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Uh, so this is a uh, tricontrahedra. If you were to take this figure and find everywhere on the figure where five planes come together and you were to truncate, truncate it along the short diagonal of the faces and you would do this everywhere, you would turn it into a, a dodecahedra. And also instead, if you were to find all the places where three planes came together at a, a vertex and you were to truncate it along the long diagonals, you would turn this back into an icosahedra. The dodecahedra and the icosahedra are duals. And this figure is a uh, fusion. May, can you say it's a union? It's a union of those two uh, figures. Is it in fact a rhombic dodecahedron? All the faces are romb rhombuses? All the faces are identical. They're rhomba. Okay. Then uh, <clears throat> what you do is you take the 20 vertexes, uh, vertices of the dodecahedra and the 10 vertices of the icosahedra. You, you, you fuse them together you throw away all the edge lines and you join up the points 
with lines of constant length. So if you go through the procedure of, oh, I should tell you, um, a Japanese physicist once very poetically told me, this is a crystal ball. You look inside it. If you find your vertices, you keep it. If not, forget about it. And if you do that the right way, you will, be, you will find that you will make these two figures. Uh, how about that? Only these two figures. The faces are all the same. Hey, that's why they tessellate. And they fit together in every which way. Now we could do the game that we just played and start cutting off corners and gluing it together. But it would be a lot easier just to take the determinant. So uh, maybe you can see it best on, the, on this one. So we have three edges that meet at a point. Each endpoint has three coordinates, three here, three here, three there. You put them into this little algebra machine, which adds and subtracts and multiplies and turns it around and out comes a single number which represents the volume in the units that you're working with. And you could do that on the fat cell too. You could do take this edge, this edge, and this edge, uh, take some from column A, some from column B, some from column C, put them in the algebra machine and out comes another number. And those two numbers representing the volumes of these two figures are in the golden ratio. So here, the volumes uh, are one to tau. No problem about going one more time. Uh, Tony, mm -hmm. can I ask a question? Yes, yes. What exactly is a quasi-crystal? Can you give us the definition? Uh, this is the definition, I'm afraid. They're uh, semi, let's see, is semi-regular crystal, uh, crystal structures, quasi-crystal, quasi-regular crystalline structures. They have five-fold symmetry which is normally disallowed by the rules of crystallography. Uh, they're aperiodic a and, um, and I think those are the fundamentals. I, I would appreciate it if I could uh, uh, hold questions until the end. Uh, I have a lot of material and it's easy for me to get mixed up. But that's the best I can do for quasi crystals. So we could go, we need an eight dimensional uh, lattice to project from. We're going to project in not into a hyperplane, but into a hyperspace. I can't draw the whole thing but you get the idea, I think. And now we need a target. Well, there is a four dimensional analog to the uh, dodec, and that is the 120 cell. It has 120 cells and 600 points. And there is uh, an analog to the icosahedron in four dimensions. And that is the 600 cell, which has 120 points. It's easy to get mixed up. So what we're looking for is something with 720 cells. And here's a page from Coxeter. And there are a bunch of them. This one looks very promising to me. 720 faces, 720 cells, 120 vertices. It's got this uh, 
Shafley symbol where the, the both ends are the same. It's probably self-dual. I'm sure this is the one. But I wasn't interested in, in going there. What I was interested in doing was using the, this tool, the determinant, to probe for the unit cells. And so I wrote this little bit of code where first uh, you take the three-dimensional determinant of the input and then use that to do the four-dimensional determinant. And I tested it. I'm not really sure what you're seeing here with these four vectors, two, zero, 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 two, zero, 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 two, zero, 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 two. And out came the number 16, two to the fourth, exactly what you would expect for a hypercube of uh, edge length two. So I'm figuring this is good code. So I took the uh, vertices of the 120 cell and I took four, four at a time, making sure that they were not collinear. And I got a series of volumes. And I kept getting, I didn't automate this to try all combinations of, of 120. I just sort of put them in by hand. And, but I kept getting the same numbers over and over again. That was very reassuring. And the numbers are in the golden ratio. So the volumes that I'm, I'm picking out here are in the golden ratio. But it seemed to me I, I, was, I, I was getting too many and maybe there were some other numbers in there and I just got very confused and, and I quit. But I'm pretty sure that the technique is sound and I put the four dimensional uh, determinant page on, on the notes and, and bibliography and um, links on that page. And if anybody follows through and figures this out, I would love to know uh, what you find. I never published this paper. It's printed with a dot matrix printer. Give you some idea of the age of it. And um, it was so many computers ago that I don't have, uh, I don't have the program anymore. Uh, I only have this printout. So there's two more things I want to say about E8 before we end part one. The first is, this is the end of the road. If it's really true that you need five-fold symmetry for your target, or that you need a target that has the square root of five somewhere in its structure, uh, then you can go no further. Coxeter tells us, and I believe him, that uh, in dimension five and greater, there are no analogs for the dodecahedra or for the icosahedra. The only polytopes that are available in dimension five and or greater are the triangle simplex, the square cube or the cross polytope, the um, uh, octahedra, right? So I think that's interesting. And um, I think some physicists can make hay out of that. Now, the last thing I wanna show you uh, before we move on to part two, is this. Yeah, this is a dome made with the, uh, um, made with the algorithm. 
and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the whole thing. There's a full dome here, but I cropped it to make this card, uh, which was uh, publicity, and it's a dome that goes like this. And we're looking straight down on it. That's why there's this really nice uh, uh, five-pointed star, this pentagon right here. So looking through the whole cell, the cells are transparent. So you're seeing the top of the cell and the bottom of the cell. And as you go out here, this is the round, you're looking through a lot of cells. And that's why it's a little bit more complicated and the lines are thicker. So this is one cell uh, quasi-crystal dome. Now, you could paint in some of those faces. And uh, look what you get. This is a Penrose tiling. So what does that mean? I wanna show you that in another way again. If you're making these blocks, and I've made hundreds of them, you first make this bar, this lozenger shaped bar, and then you cut them off, cut them off, cut them off. And you're left with an end piece and the shape of that end piece. Oh no, I, I knocked them all down. I have to go get one. The shape of that endpoint is this. And if you're making the fat lock, tell you the same story. You make this lozenger shaped bar and you cut them off, cut them off, cut them off. And you're left with an end piece. And that has, it has this shape. And I've played with cubes, hypercubes on a screen. I've spent maybe way too long doing this. And I know that you can make a hypercube look like a cube uh, by turning it. And what does this mean? It means that the three-dimensional quasi-crystal is a special case of the four-dimensional quasi-crystal. And the two-dimensional quasi-crystal is a special case of the three-dimensional quasi-crystal. And for that matter, the one-dimensional quasi-crystal is a special case of the two-dimensional quasi-crystal. If you hide all the X coordinates behind a point, just see the Y, you'll have a line. Uh, <clears throat> that's a Fibonacci series. So I feel in my bones that this Russian doll situation where the scale changes, but the pattern does not, I feel this is um, uh, really profoundly important, but I just don't exactly know what. Uh, so that uh, completes uh, the first part. And I'd like to move on to part two. And for that, I'm gonna switch back to me for a minute.
I have to change cameras. Yeah, here I am. Everything we did in part one was to select some points in the n-dimensional space, and then finally project them into the n over two space. Part two uh, begins with this question. Could you do it the other way around? Could you project everything into the uh, n over two space? Let's just, let's just say six and three. Could you project everything from the six dimensional space into three dimensions making an unholy mess of interlaced cells, but then wind your way through uh, and find just the cells that tessellate perf uh, perfectly in three dimensions. Could you do it? Yes. De Bruyne shows us how. Would that be conceptually easier? No, it would not. Would it be computationally easier? No, uh, there's an annoying amount of linear algebra that you have to swim through. But would you gain insight? Would you understand things that you couldn't understand any other way? And that is definitely it. yes, and it's, it's worth the trouble. So to begin, let's just visualize that six dimensional cubic lattice. Try to see it in front of your eyes. Everybody got that? Uh, now throw away all the boxes and just keep the axes. You have six mutually perpendicular axes, any two of which define a plane and in that plane, they are at right angles, 90 degrees. Now imagine that set of axes projected into three space uh, so that you no longer have 90 degree axes, uh, angles, mutual angles, you, they're 63.44 degrees. In radians, square root of five over two, I think. Uh, and uh, then when you take a look at it, you would see it's this. And I'm going to switch back to the tabletop. These are rays normal to the faces uh, of a dodec. Now we can learn a great deal just by looking at this node. And remember, this is not just a node at the origin. This is what happened to every node. All the, all the ones that are in columns, all rows and columns, everywhere the, there's a junction, uh, the same thing happened to those nodes. So, <clears throat> We can take uh, we can take these uh, unit uh, vectors three at a time. Uh, at, at one point they were dimensions. Now let's just call them directions. Take three at a time. Do the vector addition, and you make this cell, which, by the way, is the same as this cell. There's a lot of symmetry in these uh, skewed cubes. And you can march it five times around. I think you can see that. If you want to take out the centerpiece to make it easier, and you want to key off this, uh, this vertex, you can see that 
by taking two adjacent and one opposed, you have this figure. Again, it's the same as that figure. And uh, this you can rotate five times around. If you want to make the skinny cell, we can take these two adjacent and these two, you skip one and you can make this cell. And it's the same if I flip it around. And this you can see, I think you can walk this around five times. And if you want to key off the other corner, key off this corner, if you use this, th these three, adjacent, adjacent, and sh skip that one, you can make this, uh, you can make this figure too. So, five times around. So taking these axes three at a time, and we wanna do that because we're gonna be in three dimensions. So we wanna take three at a time. You can only make this cell and you can only make this cell. And each one of these has only two vertex figures. And each one, each block in total has 10 orientations. And so you have a total of 20 possible orientations uh, taking these three at a time. We should have known that going in because uh, 20 choose three, I'm sorry, six choose three is 20. Six choose three is 20. And so uh, <clears throat> we know that a quasi-crystal cell is going to be either this or this, and it's going to be oriented in one of those uh, one of those twenty ways. But what we don't know, what we don't got, is where it is in three dimensional space. Is it up here, over here, down here? We don't know. We don't know which node we were talking about. Where are these? Which which is that node? Where is that node in space? So that is precisely the information that is lost in the projection. <coughs> the uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth co uh, coordinate, those are gone and we have to get them back. Well, De Brun shows us a very, very elegant, clever way of doing that. On the axes, we construct planes. Two planes are gonna meet uh, along the line and the third plane, sorry, they get kind of stuck here, uh, is gonna intercept that line at a point. The intersection point. In my program, I call it inset because I don't wanna write out intersection point all the time. So um, let, me, let, me get, let me get some space here. So from the origin, I have an intersection point. And what I now do is lay a, as project this line to one of the other, one of the, axes I did not use, say, let's say it's the fourth one here. And these are gonna be marked off where the planes are. And I'm gonna find that it's in between the second and the third plane, it's in here. Now I have a choice, I can cue off the bottom one 
or queue off the top one. Let's queue off the bottom one. Then eventually I'm gonna be building a cube by going up one, plus one this way, plus one this way, plus one, 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 plus like this. Can't see what I'm doing. Uh, or I could have done the top, in which case I'm gonna go down one, I'm gonna go negative one and, and, and build the same box. It doesn't matter how you do it, you're just gonna have to be consistent. And if you're not, you make very, very beautiful patterns that are not quasi-crystal. I've done it. And you're gonna do the same thing for the other ones to the, the fifth one and uh, the sixth one. And eventually you're going to be able to fill out this chart. Let's do it. In the first direction, we were keying off uh, plane number one. In the second, plane number one. The third one, plane number one. But we discovered that uh, along the fourth uh, axis, we were, uh, we're gonna floor it, so it was a two. And this one, as it happened, it was going to be a, a, a seven. And because they're so oblique, this one's gonna be a, a 13. So now we can build a box. We can do a plus one plus one here, 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 plus, 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 plus. These numbers come down, these are incremented uh, <clears throat> with the additional, uh, the additional plus one. It certainly looks like we have something here. We have eight points, each of which have six coordinates. It looks like it's a matrix, but it's, it's not. No matrix without metrics. That's our battle cry. To the barricades, no matrix without metrics because all of these are integers. They're ordinal numbers. They're not the cardinal numbers. Consider the subway. The first stop is eight blocks away. Oh, I'm gonna, the first stop is five blocks away. The second stop is eight blocks away from the first and the third is 13 blocks away from the second. So ordinal three is cardinal 26. We've got to get the real numbers. Now, maybe that's not such a challenge as uh, you might think because everything was originally projected down into three space, there's, there's some careful analysis here that uh, I'm not sure I've fully done, <clears throat> but I do know that once you fill this in with not the first, the second and the third, but the real numbers, and you multiply that by your multiple, by your matrix, multiply, this is your uh, multiple multiplication matrix, you're going to get a cell that's going to have an orientation and it's gonna be one of these specific cells and it's now gonna have a location in three dimensional space. And if you cycle through all the planes on all the axes, uh, you will fill out a quasi crystal. Now there's more to know. Uh, oh, well, let, well, let me let me say it this way. I grant you that if you're doing the simplest Penrose tiling 
the cardinal numbers and the ordinal numbers are the same because you're laying things out. One, two, three, four. Not completely because you've, you're gonna have to jiggle these things. Otherwise you're gonna get a design uh, divide by zeros. But basically you're gonna have a one-to-one -one, uh, comparison of ordinal to cardinal. But you don't have to lay out uh, them on the, the axis like that. You could do this where the planes are laid out in a Fibonacci series. Uh, this one is all the way out here. And if you do that, the quasi crystal that you get is very dense in its isozonohedra. I have to explain that what that is in a moment. But just to realize, you don't have to have them at integer uh, position. In fact, you can have any function. And I've even thrown them in randomly. Put them here, just, just take a flyer. You do get a quasi-crystal. It does have five-fold symmetry, but it's not perfect. It has, well, I've never seen one with a hole, but you have uh, regions of... Um, overlapping cells, you have re, uh, regions of periodicity instead of aperiodicity. And uh, uh, you, you, um, you need to study what's allowed and what's not allowed. And what is it, what do I mean by an isozonohedra? Here's the intersection point, and we're going to project it on one of the axes not used. And we're going to find that it hits exactly on this node. Well, there's a technical problem. What do you mean exactly? Uh, uh, these are irrational numbers, um, but you have a uh, you have a gate plus you know, anywhere lands anywhere in this gate. We're going to call it a hit. Uh, in my program, it's plus zero zero five and minus uh, zero zero five, and the units that I'm working with are one and one point six one eight. Sometimes they're ten and sixteen, but uh, with a with a gate this tight. You can make thousands of, uh, of cells. But as you get further and further away from the origin, you're going to have to tighten this gate. So it's going to have to be a dynamic uh, function of how far away you are from the origin. But it's a technicality. It can be done. So we have, a, we have an insect hitting on exactly on a node on number four. Remember these nodes are where the planes are. So that means you have a fourth plane intersecting at a node. And that means that somewhere, not here, but somewhere uh, there's going to be a uh, hypercube, a four dimensional hypercube. that will be made there. And a hypercube projected into three space using this as your matrix multiplication uh, thing. I'm getting a little tired. Uh, you can make this. This is a rhombic dodecahedra. 
it's uh, hard to see in painted black, but this is what it is. Two fat, two fat cubes, two fat cubes and two skin cubes. Make the rhombic dodecahedra. And if it happens that five planes go through the intersection, uh, that means at that location somewhere, uh, not right there, there's a, uh, a rhombic icosahedra made. That's this figure. That is to say a five-dimensional quasi-crystal, five-dimensional, uh, ooh, I'm getting tired. Five-dimensional hypercube projected into three space using this as your projection matrix. If you can see that, makes, makes this here. Makes this figure, a rhombic icosahedra. And if all six planes meet at a point, somewhere there is a six dimensional hypercube and there can be more than more than one and then that figure that six dimensional hypercube projected into three space using this as your projection matrix makes this figure now even with these pre-assembled components there are a couple of different ways to put it together. So if they were free pieces, there would be lots of different ways that they could assemble together. I think I'd better explain a little bit more about how that comes to be. Square is tessellated if the boundary edges are edges in just two uh, squares. In three dimensions, the boundaries are uh, faces. The boundary of a cube is a face and Cubes are tessellated if, uh, if I can't turn behind this thing. If every face is a face in just two cubes. And the boundary of a hypercube are its eight uh, cells. And if each one of those cells is a cell in just uh, two hypercubes, uh, then you have. Uh, tessellation of hypercubes or what uh, Coxeter calls uh, honeycomb and so on and so forth. So inside our cubic lattice of three-dimensional cubes in six-dimensional space, there are these possible sub-assemblies. And to some extent, it's the user who chooses how to look at it. So I think I'm gonna quit here and give you my uh, conclusions. The De Bruyne algorithm clearly shows that to make quasi-crystals, the two states, the n-dimensional unprojected state and the n over two dimensional projected state must continue to be in communication or in content 
uh, contact. Maybe you could say superposition. It shows that the passage from one state to another inevitably involves both the loss and the gain of information. And that information ebb and flow is managed via a chart, a topological, non-metric entity that's neither fish nor fowl. That's a model within a model. And finally, the chart is set by the user. How she sets the planes will establish the chart and ensure that she will find what she's looking for. Uh, so are there questions or shall I show you the computer program? Uh, let's, let's have a few, a few, we're, we're running a bit late. So let's have a, just a, a few questions. Are there any questions? I wondered how many of these mathematical constructs can actually be realized by real crystals? Uh, presumably not that many. Well, you can have real life quasi crystals, as I said, uh, they're found in the lab and they're found in outer space and uh, they, um, they were thought to have very unusual magnetic or electrical properties, but so far that hasn't come to pass. The um, uh, in, uh, materials engineers have gotten a hold of this and they make quasi crystals uh, and they make surfaces that are very, very durable. They, they don't run like a diamond or uh, woman's, women's uh, hose because they're not periodic, they're aperiodic and, and they find that they're very resistant to uh, scratching. And then if it's true that uh, quasi-crystals are a model of uh, quantum phenomena, uh, then they're realized everywhere all the time. Uh, so let me, sh let me share screen here. <clears throat> so this is a triacontrahedra and uh, the aspect ratio on my computer is, is wrong. So you, you, sh you need to see it more spherically, twofold. Coming around to fivefold and then we're gonna have threefold symmetry. If you had a node in your hand rotating it, you could easily see why this happens. And this is the, this is the reason I wanna make architecture out of these uh, figures. This is uh, uh, the program that I wrote in 1985 that George Francis and his students have uh, made tremendous improvements on. Let me, let me, let me keep going. These are the icosahedras. I can show them to you in perspective. You can get a better sense of the space where they are in space, but the symmetries are, are harder to see. And you see that they're rotating around the central uh, triacontrahedra. I'm going to take perspective off. And add something else. If we were just looking for dodecahedra, for rhombic dodecahedra, pi fold, uh, two fold, two fold, and coming up, five fold again, and Threefold. These are the same cells over and over again, but we're uh, 
we're looking at them with a different template and we're finding uh, dodecahedra. Here's the central piece. Now here are the dodecahedra and the icosahedra. You can see how they fit together. Uh, they first translated my archaic Pascal into Python and put it in the cube, which is a virtual environment. And you can uh, sort of walk through this quasi crystal, swim through it, uh, peer at its parts and gain a very visceral understanding of the quasi crystal. Uh, the only better way to do it is to build sculpture and then you really know it. Here's the, the uh, I can try it in the center. Now here are the, just the individual cells. And this is what my original program did, just made cells. And uh, the fact that there's all this empty space around it's just because the loops are, are cut short. There are loops inside of loops inside of loops. And uh, if we expanded the size of the loops, then this part would be filled in, the empty space would be filled in and there would be more empty space on the outside. And I'm trying to get all of them. And this is everything. I think this is a wonderful program and it's now available on your cell phone. Uh, it's been translated, George Francis translated it this year uh, to uh, JavaScript. It'll play on any cell phone, tab, desktop, laptop, Chromebook, whatever. I think the program uh, could be improved. I don't think the human interface is uh, that intuitive, uh, but that's kind of minor. My original program provided for having uh, different inputs, in effect, different placements of the plane. And if this is going to be a research tool, uh, it, it will, the front end will have to be rewritten so that you can, you can start off with different initial conditions. Also, I'd like to have a back end. Um, we should be able to dump what we see on the screen uh, into a format that can play on other uh, three-dimensional modeling uh, platforms, such as uh, Rhino, it's very popular with engineering students, uh, Vectorworks, even SketchUp. The lingua franca of all of these programs is AutoCAD. And I've been trying for a couple of years to find somebody to uh, take the output into AutoCAD, because then it, then it could go into the wild. Who knows what would happen? Uh, but maybe it's proprietary because um, we haven't, uh, I haven't found anybody to do that. So I know uh, I would certainly welcome anybody who wants to play with this. And I'm sure uh, George Francis would too. His, his info and the links to this are also on the bibliography page. So with that, uh, I'll say uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. And um, uh, if you, uh, if I could try to answer any questions, I, I will. Well, I, I think we're running a bit late. So um, I suggest, uh, thank you very much, um, Tony. Um, I suggest if anybody's got any uh, questions, they can send them to me and I will forward them to Tony or unless they have. Um, um, email him directly, ask him, um, and, it will, and we will make sure that if anybody wants to have access to this program, um, we can uh, get it from, from Lou's website. I think that's okay. Is that all right, Tony? 
Oh yeah, of course. It's uh, <clears throat> yeah. You just uh, go to uh, University of Illinois, Illinois Champlain, and um, type in quasi crystal. You'll find it. But the link, direct link, is is on that page I, I gave to Lou. Yeah. Okay. That's brilliant. Okay, so well, well, thanks again, Tony. And, well, thanks, for, um, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. No, to no, explain no, that in this a very this stimulating uh, talk. And um, anyway, it will be uh, the recording of the talk will be available uh, in a day or two. So I'm going to stop now. So thanks to everybody, and see you in a week's time.